Good afternoon. We're here to discuss Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, really a grand statement of protest literature. It's considered to be one of the most persuasive uh, pieces of writing from the 20th century, actually. So very famous, uh, very famous uh, letter uh, of Dr. King's, very famous document. Um, why are we studying this uh, uh, for English 101? And that's simply because uh, for two reasons, uh, actually. Uh, and one is Dr. King was greatly inspired by Henry David Thoreau, by Thoreau's civil disobedience. In fact, Dr. King wrote a separate essay entitled Love, Law, and Civil Disobedience. If you all get a chance to read that, that would be wonderful. Uh, I've studied that in the classroom as well, but um, we don't have uh, enough time uh, in this remote setting. Dr. King's Love, Law, and Civil Disobedience, worth reading. Actually, Dr. King also talks uh, a lot about uh, several of Thoreau's notions, including nonviolent resistance uh, in this letter of his uh, that we're about to read. So uh, this is uh, this logical progression from Thoreau to Dr. King, as we're going to see uh, subsequently to Cesar Chavez, the great Cesar Chavez. Uh, the other reason why we're studying uh, this monumental work of writing uh, is because uh, for our argument essays, um, this is going to be helpful. Uh, Dr. King uh, does have a certain method he uses here uh, when he's talking uh, about um, his opponents. Dr. King paraphrases an argument that is set forth by his opponents, in this case, the eight white clergymen. Uh, and so he's counteracting it uh, by uh, backing his counter argument with facts, uh, with examples, uh, with references to historical figures, uh, as we're going to see. So uh, really, uh, what, what he's doing uh, makes his letter appear to be quite logical. And so anyone who disagrees with what he is uh, saying, espousing in this letter, must be illogical. So um, it's, it's not only just beautiful, beautifully written and eloquent and so impressive uh, in, in numerous ways, but just to see it as a logical argument uh, is fascinating as well. So, uh, so we're going to be inspired uh, in numerous ways uh, having read this. It's available in this module. Uh, I have the PDF of the document in this module, and so I'm just going to be going along uh, you know, making a few comments here and there, highlighting several of his quotes. So uh, I can't wait to hear, uh, you know, in our online discussion, what your thoughts, what your thoughts are going to be. So uh, let me just back up a bit before we dive right into this um, uh, mesmerizing at times uh, letter here. Uh, so what was going on? What was the sort of uh, social climate like in Birmingham when this letter was written in April of 1963? Well, it was a description graceful environment. Uh, it was one where there were numerous whites only signs, quote unquote, whites only signs, um, you know, on the doors of dressing rooms and waiting rooms uh, and restrooms. Uh, hotel entrances uh, had these signs. Uh, laundromats, restaurants, I mean, it really talk about disgraceful. Uh, for instance, one, one uh, you know, uh, thing comes to mind, the Alabama annual state fair. The Alabama annual state fair was a big deal. It was about 10 or 11 days long, um, but it was for whites only, unfortunately. Uh, there was a quote-unquote black day, just one day out of these 10 or 11 days where African Americans were allowed to attend. Um, just so far reaching and just talking about the statewide segregation ordinances. Uh, where, you know, black Americans were relegated to separate railroad cars, hospitals, schools, even drinking fountains. So, yes, this was quite a shameful era in our history. Uh, and so, uh, really, again, it's inspiring to read uh, what Dr. King uh, is espousing here uh, as, as the great leader of the civil rights movement. Um, and so uh, he had a purpose for this letter, Dr. King. He was imprisoned, uh, of course, letter from Birmingham jail. This was a 72-hour time span where Dr. King was in prison. Uh, can you picture this? He was just in a tiny uh, prison cell. It was 54 square feet. That's it uh, for his um, for 
for his uh, sleeping accommodations. What did he have? There were no mattresses, uh, you know, no mattress uh, available for him. It was a, a metal cot, a six foot metal cot, really uncomfortable. Um, there was just no overhead light no windows. So can you imagine for 72 hours? Uh, and so Dr. King, uh, how could he write uh, this letter uh, under those circumstances, especially when he wasn't allowed to have any paper or anything in his cell? So uh, he had to write on scraps of paper. Uh, a kindly black attendant um, in, the, in the prison gave him uh, some paper to write on. And so, I mean, can you imagine this is what thousands of words uh, I think it was originally 15,000 words, uh, but uh, it was cut down uh, to, to a 7,000 word letter here. And so how could this have been done under these awful circumstances, terrible circumstances with scant daylight just coming from the top of his cell, uh, you know, smuggling, having smuggled these uh, pieces of uh, paper, scraps, scraps of paper with his writings. Um, he was at the time, Dr. King, the president of the SCLC. We're going to come across the abbreviation several times. SCLC is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so uh, what he would write on these uh, scraps of paper, they were uh, given over to the headquarters, SCLC headquarters. Uh, there was a secretary there, you know, typing away. And so really, when you think of the circumstances, how this came to be, many people thought at the time that this was a divinely inspired text. And I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. So by the way, there's a lot of biblical references. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of those, uh, some of those as well. So uh, I think it's clear here, um, this letter uh, it was it was written and sent to the media media outlets. It was never signed, sealed, delivered to its intended recipients. Who were the recipients of this letter? Well, this is Dr. King's response. This seven thousand word rebuttal is a response to these eight white ministers, eight white uh, clergymen who had uh, issued a letter. It was just you know a little over four hundred words, and this was what the response was. But uh, they never got uh, a response uh, in their hands. Uh, Dr. King's response was uh, you know published uh, by the media. So. Therefore, you know, uh, it's almost as if the purpose for this letter is like that of all open letters uh, from prison, and that's to persuade a larger audience, uh, which it did. It was written for media consumption, is what it was intended. And, you know, some of the clergymen were upset and frustrated about that, that they were never directly uh, communicated with. Uh, this is considered to be a great, uh, you know, masterpiece of literature grand statement of protest literature. Uh, and so uh, really, I feel like it was one of the most important documents that ever came forth, that ever issued forth from the civil rights era. So it, it's almost as if this letter, it laid the strong moral basis, intellectual basis for the civil rights movement. Um, as I mentioned, it's supposed to be considered uh, one of the strongest pieces of persuasive writing uh, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, to come out of uh, this country in the 20th century. So uh, anyhow, there's uh, a lot of use of biblical references as we're going to get to. He's quoting, uh, you know, classical uh, philosophers like Socrates. Uh, there's uh, historical figures, Western um, historical figures, church figures, uh, and so forth. He's doing all of this to make this uh, writing uh, of his more persuasive, uh, which it is. For instance, um, he is mentioning the Apostle Paul, and he's comparing himself, Dr. King, uh, with this biblical figure of Paul, uh, you know, at certain points. Uh, and so it, it feels like this reads like a sermon more than just correspondence. Uh, so again, you can see that it's meant uh, for a larger audience. Uh, as I mentioned, the original text was 15,000 words. Uh, at least a third of it, if not more, uh, was taken out. Um, just really quickly to summarize. Uh, so first, we get this letter uh, that is published in April of 1963. Then there's the unfortunate bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, and so this is uh, in Alabama. And so, I mean, four little girls were killed. Uh, at least 20 people were injured. 
a church being bombed. My gosh. Uh, and then, uh, so then uh, the next, uh, you know, event uh, would have been President Kennedy uh, inviting uh, the eight white clergymen uh, to the White House. Uh, that was in September of 1963. 1963 in response to all that was uh, happening. So um, let's talk, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, this uh, letter that we have. And so uh, I think there's eight or nine pages. And so I'm just going to go through maybe a couple quotes, a couple points to keep in mind uh, as we're going through this. So do you see uh, in the first paragraph, uh, he's talking about um, what the white clergyman in their original letter wrote that, uh, you know, these demonstrations on behalf of civil rights uh, supporters are quote unquote unwise and untimely. Uh, and so look at what Dr. King says in paragraph one. This is on page one. I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth. Do you see he is not agitated? He's not angry. His state of mind is one of tranquility and he's showing his rationality here. Uh, and so that makes it even more persuasive, right? For us, the reader. Uh, and so uh, remember I, I mentioned to you, Dr. King paraphrases an argument that's set forth uh, by the opposition and then he has a counter argument. Well, this is a first such instance. This is what we're doing in our argument essays, by the way, uh, later this semester. Look at, look at the second paragraph. It says, you've been influenced by the view which argues against quote unquote outsiders coming in. Uh, and so uh, how is he refuting this? Uh, how can they be uh, outsiders? Look at paragraph four on page one. Quote unquote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial quote unquote outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Do you see the way Dr. King just refuted uh, what the white ministers had said. And so um, before that, in the third paragraph, he has this great analogy where he's comp comparing himself uh, to the Apostle Paul. So, and he says, you know, I'm in Birmingham because injustice uh, is here. So uh, take a look uh, here um, at, at what he's saying. This is uh, the second to last paragraph uh, on page one. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. So now Dr. King is going to go through this logical step-by-step -step process and what must be uh, a solution. It's the last paragraph on page one. He says that there's, uh, in a nonviolent campaign, there's four basic steps. The first is the collection of facts. The next is negotiation, purification, self-purification, uh, and direct action. So you see this is a very logical uh, argument that he, is, uh, that he is setting forth here. Well, he says on page six, uh, you know, in the second paragraph, that there was no possibility for negotiation because uh, the civil rights supporters are, quote unquote, the victims of a broken promise. Uh, and so now he says, page two, the third paragraph, he's talking about direct action. Uh, and he says, mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. That's the third step. Uh, self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the, endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Uh, so basically, what is he saying in this paragraph? That uh, they're going to hold this during what's an importantly uh, economic time period. Uh, and so if they withdraw their business, you know, uh, from the community, yeah, that's going to make an impact. So that's brilliant. Uh, that's a brilliant uh, strategy right here. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. That's wonderful. Uh, he, he's going on here 
uh, talking about, um, let's see, this is the fourth paragraph, I believe, on page two. Uh, he says, negotiation is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct act action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer uh, be ignored. Uh, so that's that's exactly what he's doing here, right? That's exactly what he's doing in this letter. Uh, he goes on second to last paragraph on the same page. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. So he uses throughout this uh, letter of his references to, uh, you know, Socrates, for example, in that lengthy paragraph on page two, references, uh, you know, later to the U.S. Constitution. And so by doing so, he's raising the civil rights movement uh, to that level of significance. Um, and so uh, moving on here. So now, uh, again, talk, talking about what the opponent is bringing up, and then he's going to refute it. Take a look at the bottom of page two. Again, in response to, quote unquote, the untimeliness of these civil rights uh, demonstrations uh, and peaceful protests. In response to that, uh, by the way, I mean, it's unbelievable. During this time period, even Time magazine, uh, even the Washington Post criticized the SCLC campaign, uh, you know, as a poorly timed protest that, you know, these are untimely. The Washington Post, Time magazine, uh, unbelievable. So, I mean, even America's foremost evangelical uh, leader, uh, Billy Graham, the Reverend Billy Graham, uh, also uh, felt that these civil rights leaders should, quote unquote, put the brakes on a little bit. I have that quote from elsewhere. So my goodness gracious, uh, yeah, very reprehensible, uh, reprehensible uh, era uh, here, clearly. So uh, moving on. Um, so how does he refute the untimeliness? This is powerful. This is really powerful. What we're about to read, and for me, it's the most emotional part of this letter. It's the most persuasive part of this letter. Wow. Look at how he is going to refute uh, the issue of the untimeliness uh, you know, that the opposition is talking about. Uh, we're about to get to it. Take a look. This is page three. Page three, the second paragraph, he says, I've yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was, quote unquote, well timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every black American with piercing familiarity. This, quote unquote, wait has almost meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. So this is the part I'm talking about. It's that lengthy paragraph on page three. It's his most emotional plea, most persuasive plea. I counted over 300 words in this one sentence. It's brilliant. It's a series of dependent clauses. It's exploring the troubled souls in, uh, you know, of Southern blacks in, in segregated, uh, in the segregated South. So uh, moving on, my gosh, take a look here. He talks about uh, in that third paragraph on page three, the quote unquote, stinging dark darts of segregation. Take a look, page three, quote unquote, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. When you see the majority of your 20 million uh, black brothers smoldering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to African-American children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer to a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? 
when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by the nagging signs reading white and colored, when your name when your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a black American living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. It's just so powerful, isn't it? Uh, look at the power of his rhetoric. And so now he's saying the cup of endurance runs over. The time comes when the cup of endurance, um, you know, uh, overflows and people are no longer willing to tolerate such despair and such injustice. So... Uh, now, uh, moving on, this is at the bottom of page three. This is going to be very familiar, talking about Thoreau's concept of just laws and unjust laws. Uh, take a look, bottom of page three. There are two types of laws, just and unjust. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And so now he is coming up with these definitions at the bottom of page three. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of, law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony uh, with the moral law. Uh, he goes on further. This is, uh, this is the bottom uh, of page four now, bottom of page four. Uh, and so he's uh, saying, top of page four. Uh, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. So uh, really, basically, what is he talking about here in terms uh, of an unjust law? He, he talks about this uh, further uh, throughout um, page four. He talks about in the third paragraph how an unjust law is a code inflicted by the majority on the minority that the majority was unwilling to apply uh, to itself. And so he points out in paragraph three the quote-unquote devious methods that were used to prevent black Americans from registering to vote. And so Dr. King is questioning whether the Alabama state legislature that enacted the segregation laws had even been democratically elected. Um, take a look. Uh, further, uh, he says, uh, this is the middle of page four, sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. So sometimes on the surface, a law appears just, but it's unjust in, in the way it's applied. Uh, and he gives us examples at the bottom of page four. He says, for example, um, well, this is in the middle of the page he's talking about. It was just, it was just to have an ordinance to require a par parade permit but the ordinance became unjust when it was used to maintain segregation and to deny the right to peaceful protest. At the bottom of uh, you know, page uh, four, he does give us examples. Dr. King says that if he had lived in Nazi Germany under Hitler, he would have illegally eased the suffering of his quote unquote Jewish brothers. Uh, or if he had lived in communist uh, in a communist country where the government suppressed the Christian faith, Dr. King would have advocated disobeying the anti-religious codes. So um, also there's a very fascinating concept here, another one of, of Thoreau's. Take a look in the middle of page four. In the middle of page four, he says uh, to the white clergyman, I hope you were able to see the distinction I'm trying to point out in no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationist? That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, 
uh, and with it with a willingness to accept the penalty so disobeying an unjust law according to dr king has to be done with love not with hate um he says um I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts a penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expe expressing the highest respect for the law. Uh, echoes of Thoreau, right? He's reflecting on the words and actions of Henry David Thoreau, firmly believing that a person expresses the highest respect for the law by breaking a code that they deem to be unjust and willingly accepting a jail term to arouse the conscience of the community. You know, Dr. King had told his supporters uh, at one event, this is during the early days of the civil rights movement, that he would face imprisonment because it was, quote unquote, better to go to jail in dignity than to accept segregation. So another uh, another concept, uh, another concept of uh, Thoreau's here uh, that we have. Uh, moving along, uh, moving along here. By the way, um, on page four in the second to last paragraph, uh, there's names, there's several uh, names that he mentions, historical figures, and they were the early practitioners uh, of civil disobedience. Uh, and he explicitly uses the term civil disobedience there. Second to last paragraph on page four. Moving on, uh, moving on. So uh, here now, um, he is, uh, I'm looking at the first paragraph on page five. He's talking about the white moderate, uh, the white moderate who, who might support these civil rights protesters, but doesn't take any action, doesn't directly involve himself or herself uh, for this just cause. So, uh, and so this is uh, in the first paragraph of page uh, five. He says, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. Um, actually, he says, um, you know, uh, he's reached this unfortunate conclusion that the greatest obstacle in uh, black Americans' stride uh, towards freedom is not the Ku Klux Klan, it's not the KKK, or the a angry members of the White Citizens Council. The problem, the greatest stumbling block, the greatest obstacle to moving forward is the white moderate. Take a look, top of page five, uh, he says, uh, the white moderate is more devoted uh, to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is a presence of justice, uh, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. So, um, again, talking about how untimely, uh, you know, uh, the opposition had said that this was untimely, the demonstrations, uh, he, he's uh, responding to that as well. Take a look, uh, paragraph one, page five, uh, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. So, uh, you know, he, he also, uh, what he does is draw this parallel with uh, Christ's renunciation of lukewarm Christianity in the book of Revelation. Uh, Dr. King felt uh, he has to reject a lukewarm acceptance from white moderates. Um, moving on here, moving on. And, he, and we just read where he said, uh, Dr. King, that he thought white moderates were more devoted to order than to justice, that they preferred to have a negative peace where there was no tension than a positive peace where there would be justice, where justice would prevail. Moving on, uh, he says in the middle of page five, in your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Uh, look at his use of uh, repetition. Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? So repetition is a wonderful literary device that Dr. King uses. Again, you feel like this is meant to have been verbalized and read. It's not simply meant to be seen as a sort of written document. 
Uh, another aspect I appreciate about this literary masterpiece is metaphors and similes. Take a look in the middle of page five at the end of the second paragraph there. Look at this simile. Like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, injustice must be exposed with all the tension it its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of natural opinion before it can be cured. Wow, what an explicit uh, simile uh, he has here. Uh, interesting simile. So uh, moving on now, uh, he uh, refers uh, page five at the bottom. Uh, he says, uh, Dr. King, that he had received a letter from a white Christian in Texas. Uh, and in the letter, the man uh, was urging Dr. King to have a uh, slow, gradual change. And he was accusing black activists of seeking equal rights, quote unquote, in a great religious hurry. Do you see that uh, page five at the bottom? He says he got a letter from a white brother in Texas. Um, uh, and this is what it said. Uh, th this is what the letter said. Uh, is it possible that you are in too great a religious hurry? It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. That's what was in the letter. Now look at how he is refuting this. This is again talking about this wonderful movement being quote unquote untimely. Look at how Dr. King refutes it. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time from the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. Um, he goes on, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people, the white moderate. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. Another great uh, metaphor here, another great metaphor. So this tragic misconception of time, in other words, was irrational, Dr. King argued, and it rested upon the naive idea that time will cure society's problems. Uh, and actually hostile segregationists made more constructive use of time uh, than, than white moderates. So uh, anyhow, uh, moving on here, uh, page six. Uh, another um, argument that, his, uh, that the opposition is bringing up, top of page six, you speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. Uh, how is he going to turn that around? Well, look at how he responds, bottom of page six, bottom paragraph. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized in, as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Quote, unquote, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's engraved uh, on Dr. King's monuments, on, on one of monuments in, in tribute to Dr. King. He mentions other figures here, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so King is pointing uh, to Jesus Christ, to the prophet Amos, uh, to Abraham Lincoln, uh, and, and Thomas Jefferson as, as examples of historical uh, extremists. So uh, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. And so he's turning what appears to be a negative label uh, into something positive. Um, so uh, very well done. And so really then the South, the nation, and the world at that time desperately needed more creative extremists for love and justice. And Dr. King hoped that the white moderates would recognize, would recognize this need. Moving on, uh, moving on, I'm going uh, to page eight uh, here, uh, to page eight. You know, this was written by the way, this was written close to the Easter season in April of 1963. And so the decision, I feel like that, that Dr. The decision that was made to send Dr. King to jail at this time, I just, you know, the symbolism is quite apparent. Um, I think of Jesus on the cross. I think of uh, Jesus, uh, you know, um, dragging 
that heavy wooden cross on his journey to crucifixion and to certain death. And so it's almost as if, I don't know, Dr. King is stepping forward from Gethsemane, the biblical Gethsemane, which is really his motel, the Gaston Motel, to pick up the wooden cross uh, and to march for racial justice. So it's just, you know, I feel like uh, it's a highly symbolic time that unfortunately Dr. King uh, was imprisoned here. And so uh, he really wanted, uh, Dr. King, he really wanted uh, the civil rights movement to transform jails into church houses, uh, interestingly. So uh, moving on, moving on. So many great metaphors, similes. So uh, as we're concluding this letter, uh, this brilliant letter of Dr. King's, uh, take a look uh, on page nine. Take a look on page nine. I'm just really inspired here uh, by that top paragraph. My gosh, one of the most inspiring. Take a look, top of page nine. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are at present misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. What a great man, what, what a great man uh, Dr. King uh, was. You know, um, sadly, devastatingly, when he was killed, he was only 39, he was only 39 years old. My gosh, the injustice of it. Uh, anyhow, uh, he goes on, this is the second paragraph uh, on page nine. He says, before closing the letter, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your, in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warmly commended the Birmingham police force for quote unquote, keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen its dogs sinking their teeth into unarmed, nonviolent black Americans. I doubt that you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were to observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of blacks here in the city jail. Uh, and he goes on. So um, again, he's using uh, the technique of repetition, uh, and that has such a resounding uh, effect, such a resounding effect, doesn't it? Finally, uh, I feel like the last metaphor uh, is also extraordinary. This is the very last line on the last page. He says, let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Extraordinary in its beauty, uh, Dr. King's writing is. So can you imagine now, uh, after you know the media uh, was given this letter, after it was published, what the backlash was against these eight clergymen uh, who I told you earlier felt frustrated that they were never directly addressed uh, in such a manner, that they found out about this correspondence, you know, correspondence uh, when uh, the media uh, had published it. So um, it's, it's interesting when you read the accounts of the aftermath of this letter in terms of these eight white clergymen. Um, one of them was a rabbi and, uh, you know, for example, uh, what happened is uh, a rabbinical uh, conference uh, moved from the north. There, there were northern rabbis, I, I can't remember, maybe 20 of them or so, 
who decided that they were going to go uh, and visit one of the rabbis who was addressed in this letter, Dr. King's letter. Uh, and so uh, it was Rabbi Grafman uh, who was uh, one of the recipients of this letter. And so he felt so resentful. He thought, here are these northerners, the, these uh, clergymen coming from the north. They're here for a couple of hours. Uh, actually, they came. Uh, the rabbis from the north uh, came secretly without letting uh, you know the, the congregation know in Alabama. They came, I think, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they came over secretly, and then they came to uh, the Baptist church. Uh, and and preach, you know, uh, that they, they said, you know, uh, to the parishioners, your people are our people, anything we can do to help. Uh, and it, it seemed like it was some fanciful crusade that they were on because just a couple hours later, these clergymen were back uh, on a plane on a red eye uh, and, and out of uh, out of Birmingham. And so, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot to deal with in terms of these clergymen. Some of them, many of them got death threats. Uh, you know, after this letter was uh, published uh, because they decided to take a stand for these civil rights supporters in their congregations. As a result, you know, they were threatened. They would get threatening phone calls, threatening letters. Uh, they were afraid that, uh, you know, their houses might be bombed. Uh, so um, it, it took a toll on them physically, several of them as well. I know one of them, uh, you know, uh, Reverend Durick, he became uh, an alcoholic and really he devoted uh, most of his life to helping, uh, you know, uh, civil rights supporters, um, several others, several others who had to move their congregation because uh, even though they were speaking up, uh, you know, uh, you know, in advocacy of civil rights, uh, because of threats, they had to, they had to move their to another congregation. They had to move elsewhere. They had to move their families and be uprooted. So um, I'm not saying I would feel bad necessarily for these white clergymen, but yeah, it just caused a lot of turmoil in their lives. Uh, and so, um, but you know, uh, I feel like uh, the majority of them really quote unquote saw the light uh, and realized uh, the injustice. Uh, the injustice of segregation, the injustice of waiting and waiting for so long uh, to be granted equal rights, uh, black Americans to be uh, granted equal rights. So uh, anyhow, this, uh, I, I can't wait, as I mentioned uh, before, to see what your responses are for our online discussion. Uh, and I can't wait to see what quotes you pick up from this brilliant letter of Dr. King's that really might resonate with you. Uh, I read to you what I thought was the most emotional uh, part of the letter for me. So uh, anyhow, um, look forward to hearing your responses. And in the meantime, uh, happy reading. Happy reading. Take care.